Hi, so um, I'm here with Benita Kane, and uh, we're going to discuss uh, the situation of long COVID in kids. And first, Benita, why don't you introduce yourself and explain who you are and where you work? Hello. Hi, David. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm uh, Benita Kane. I'm a I'm a consultant adult chest physician. Uh, so I've been on the front line of the pandemic over the last few years. Uh, I have a special interest in long COVID and I work in the UK in Manchester. Okay. So how did you um, start being involved? I mean, so you've been, uh, obviously you're not, you're not a pediatrician, but you've been involved in the situation of long COVID uh, and in kids. And so first, how did that start happening? I mean, what, what got your interest in that particular aspect of this? My interest has been sparked really by the lived experience of my own daughter going through a very difficult long COVID journey. So she was, um, she was ill in January 2021. And at that time, I think we were still learning about long COVID and no one was really talking about it in children. Uh, she was 10 years old at the time. And so for children um, were kind of immune, they were relatively immune and children were not being thought, were not reporting long COVID or it just wasn't being noticed, do you think? I think no one was talking about it. I think... Um, I think there was some patient groups that were kind of had found, you know, patients who'd found each other and families that had found each other. And, uh, but I think amongst the medical community, we were just about recognizing this as a thing in adults. Um, but no one was really talking about it in children at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so she had a pretty mild illness to start with. Uh, a few weeks later, um, ended up with very severe abdominal pain and ended up going into hospital. Uh, that grumbled on and she just never really recovered and what I now know is a bit of a boom and bust cycle and I went through the help that was available in the UK via the NHS and at the end of it we were just told you know she's got ME-CFS and we were sent to the clinic where she had a lovely physio who he gave us some advice um, which ultimately made her worse actually and how old was she or how old was she at the time? So she was she was 10 at the time. Okay. And she's 12 now. Okay. Uh so we we went through that whole process. And at the end of it, it was kind of like your blood tests are fine. You just need like physio and sleep hygiene and things like that, which we were doing anyway and pacing. Um and I just thought, you know what, this is this is just not right. My child is really sick. This is a perfectly healthy. 10 year old very active very fit and um she was going to school about three hours a week because she was so fatigued and what was it that they she couldn't walk more than what was the reason that made her worse she said or was it that they were giving her exercise to do or or too much to so do it was just yeah I mean it was it it wasn't it wasn't sort of graded exercise in the in right in, in the sense that would have been prescribed pres historically but it was very much about you need to get her into the same routine you have to wake her up at the same time every day and then I would we were sending her into school as and when she had the energy to do it they were like no try and send her in every single day so we tried that for a couple of weeks and of course she crashed because um that's not how it works I know that in hindsight now and I just really started to educate myself about uh ME um and then of course the the uh, the numbers of people with long COVID were growing at this time. And so I recognized that, you know, there's an overlap between those two syndromes and she had long COVID. It was kind of an ME type of long COVID. Uh, and so, and then I realized as a doctor, I knew nothing about it. Like no one had ever taught me about ME when I was training. Did and- Did post-exertional malaise as a, as a phenomenon? Yes, she did, yeah. No, did, yeah. you, did you know about that as a clinician? Did you oh, know? Oh, no, 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 not not before the pandemic so we we um i think what i've realized now in hindsight is that people with me are often behind closed doors can't access treatment um discharged from most clinics with various mm -hmm. labels and so as a doctor you don't encounter people in in your day-to-day -day life you know i was a respiratory consultant i'm i'm not seeing people with me i've never been taught about it um and I'm quite horrified now when I look back at the history and I, I understand how big the community is worldwide uh, that people with ME have been left like this and treated like this. And of course, many, many people with long COVID are now falling into the same 
category of just well, sort of my experience when, I, when I started reporting about this it's sort of like so many people that you don't see and that you don't really know about you know yeah. that homebound or mostly you know homebound and it, it's it's it is kind of uh, uh, well it's eye-opening to sort of realize that that's going on but you don't see it so okay so you had your daughter's situation and then what happened in terms of um being aware of more kids or sort of more getting more involved in that in in, in that uh, domain like everybody else i i turned to the the facebook forums and tried to, to learn everything i possibly could about this condition and um, and then I connected with um, the wonderful Sammy McFarland, who's the founder of the charity Long COVID Kids, which is the biggest charity and support group for children um, in the world. And uh, I think there's there's well over 10,000 members just on the Facebook group, and it just keeps growing with every wave. Um, and and I, you know, we we just started chatting. I was like, we've we've got to be able to do something. This is this isn't right. But, and going back to the previous point, we were just talking about. These children are stuck. They go through the usual services. They have a standard set of blood tests. They're all usually come back normal. And then they're told, oh, you just need to rest and pace. Then you're trying to get them help with school because they can't manage school. So children with long COVID can learn. They just can't learn in a school environment because it's grueling. <laughs> it's like long periods of concentration. It's activity, it's noise, it's light. Um, so they... But then without a proper diagnosis, they can't get the support they need. So there's these children that are just stuck for months and months and months, parents getting slapped with fines in the UK because the kids aren't going into school. And, so how much is you know, that, it's a mess. How much is that happening in terms of processes against parents? I know truancy is actually a, a serious situation, or I mean, it can be a serious charge. How much is that happening that parents are getting uh, sanctioned in some sort of way? I, I I couldn't quote you the statistics. I just um I get alerted about various individual cases through the charity. Um, but what I would say is the UK government has put a huge emphasis on attendance at school, and they've removed all mitigations in school. Uh, and the schools really are a, a place that is not particularly safe if you've got a, a child with long COVID because every reinfection has its impact and. So um, there are parents who've kept their children away from school and are, are now being prosecuted for it. What's your... Which uh, is quite scary. Uh, that's very scary. What is your daughter's situation at the moment? So I um, ended up uh, connecting with various international researchers, um, including Risha Pretorius and Yaku Labsha from South Africa and Beata Jaeger in Germany and um, helped by my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Asad Khan, mm -hmm. we went over to Germany at the time where Beata was just starting the, the microclot testing. Um, and we had Jasmine's bloods done. She had her fluorescent mi microscopy done and her platelets were uh, horrendous, really, really clumped together, very, very hyperactivated. She had the microclots. And so she was put on treatment. Now, I deliberately don't share the name of the treatment because um, I don't want sort of copycat uh, prescribing. I think these, I think it, it's very important that the, the diagnostic tests are done, mm -hmm. ideally as part of a research study, um, and that the, any therapy is really carefully supervised by a physician. But it was experimental at, at that time. And we knew that there was potentially risks with treatment, but we just thought, you know, this this poor child's been housebound for a year. Pretty specifically, we can't do nothing. Targeting the blood clotting, the blood clotting situation. Yeah, and the platelet clumping together. Um, so we ended up going back to Germany four times between uh, February and August of twenty two, um, because it's the only way we could access any sort of any sort of treatment. But it was just medical. Um, therapy she didn't have any of the blood washing treatment or anything like that because she was so young um and just slowly but surely over six months she 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 got a lot better and I think the turning point so she started treatment in the February the turning point was the summer and we went on holiday and she was just able to do a lot more than we expected you know we took the wheelchair and we didn't use it much other than in the airport and on the last trip to Germany she walked into Dr Jaeger's office um having had a chair for all the other visits mm. and then she started high school in September and has barely had any time off and is living a 
completely normal and full life, bar she's not quite doing PE yet. But other than that, she's doing everything else. She's not what yet, did you say? She's not doing physical um, education, you know, she's not doing PE. Okay. But she's doing everything else. And she's socialising, she's able to be with her friends. Socialising, oh, sleepover, okay. she managed... She managed to do a three-day residential um, away with the school, which just would have been the stuff of dreams a year ago. Now, that seems like more progress than some of the other kids probably you're, you know about are making. Um, some of them have, uh, uh, do you see that kind of progress among many of the other kids or do you see some of them just remaining uh, as sick as they were? I think it's difficult to comment because... Um, children just don't have access to treatment by and large so there's one or two who might have made it over to Germany and there's very um, mixed reports about outcomes because we're not measuring it properly we're not doing this as part of research I think parents are desperate that you know as you as as I was you'd do anything to get your child better um, but I had the advantage of being linked with all the world's researchers and being a doctor whereas if you're a parent who doesn't have that background, the support and the monitoring and all of that just isn't there. So it's hard to know if it's that the medication is not working or it's just we're not using the right drugs or we're not doing the right test to monitor response. Um, what do you see in terms of the um, treatment of the system uh, of parents? Are you, when you were initially uh, dealing with your daughters, was you, you and your daughter getting told, oh, it's psychological, oh, she's just depressed, or were you getting told, well, you're, you know, whatever it is, you're not pushing her enough or that kind of thing? Or, and do you see that happening with other families? Um, so, I mean, I think for me, I didn't have that experience, but I have the, um, the benefit of I was seeing colleagues in my own organization and um so so that I didn't have that experience personally but I do know of lots of other families who have um so I know of families where when they've been assessed the parent has been uh, separated from the child and they've been interrogated separately I know a family who um started their child on aspirin and then got reported to child services um, and then had social services sort of descending on, on their house. And the child had improved, actually, on the aspirin. Mm -hmm. um, but it, because it had been prescribed outside of, you know, the clinic. And um, there's some horrendous there's some horrendous stories out there. We know there's a lot of children who um, and young people who are going to the emergency department because they're having collapses or their heart rates are going very fast, probably because they've got undiagnosed POTS. Mm -hmm. um and then being told they're anxious um and the the nhs services are very much set up at the moment around psychological therapy and cbt and physio cognitive behavioral therapy, therapy for those who don't know what cbt is it seems to be the only kind of psychotherapy offered in the uk as far as i can tell because everything seems to be cbt um so yeah uh, so do you, you do find that with the, with with the kids are offered those kinds of things as well, CBT. Yes, yes, and I think there are. I mean, I think part of the problem is there's huge variation across the country in terms of what is available. So if you're in London, you probably get the best services, and they've got access to more tests, and um, they will, you know, potentially try one or two treatments. But in most places up and down the country, you you know parents are not getting access to trials of treatments even simple things like antihistamines um and there's just this real reticence to do treatment trials without a randomized control trial base it's it's mm -hmm. it seems to me worse than in the adult world because at least in the adult world we we can do that to some extent to what extent are kids getting um I mean, obviously, many long COVID patients don't fall into the ME category, but some do. To what extent do you see kids getting ME diagnoses at this point? Again, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on the statistics mm -hmm. or the figures. Um, but what I would say is there is definitely a big overlap. And I think so. there's a there's a pediatrician in um, Italy called Danilo Buonsenso, who I'd say is probably the world's leading researcher in long COVID in children and he wrote a paper last year just describing two kind of clear groups 
One is the group of children who um, are very sick and they've been in hospital and they've got the multi-system inflammatory syndrome and then they have more maybe organ specific type problems afterwards. And then there's the group like Jasmine who maybe have just quite a mild illness to start with um, and then develop ongoing chronic fatigue and pain and, um, and palpitations. All the non-specific symptoms, non symptoms that are hard to pin to anything in particular. Absolutely. And, and and so I think what we don't fully understand really is those what we call phenotypes, those groupings of patients based on their clinical features. And a lot of the research around um, children is really difficult because uh, in the UK, we've had mass infection. You know, most kids have when they've tested have got antibodies and we've had hardly any vaccination in, in children. Uh, and so trying to find a really good control group to compare things with, we don't, a lot of people weren't testing kids. So we don't know if they've had asymptomatic infection or a bit of a, you know, cold and actually had COVID. So then when you're trying to compare, you know, this is why we really need the biomarkers. So we're, we're not relying on really crude tests, um, like, you know, like patient reported PCR positivity or lateral flow tests, because it, it it's very difficult. So where do you see things going? I mean, we're now three years into this or, you know, three and a half years. Where do you see things going with uh, specifically with the kids? Do you see the, do you see it continuing or do you have, have we sort of, uh, I mean, do you see new kids getting long COVID now uh, from new infections or are we really dealing with kids who sort of got infected in the first sort of wave? Uh, so there was a, a recent paper um, by Shemez Ladani and the group, I think it was actually the, the Clock Consortium, who have shown that um, reinfection is a serious problem. Long COVID after reinfection is a serious problem. Uh, and that's that's with Omicron. So uh, I know of children you, who... You had long COVID in the first place. The second, or if you have long COVID from the first infection and then you get a second infection, or if you did not have long COVID... From the first infection but then you get a second no, no, that your yeah your long covid diagnosis is from the second infection and the long covid kids survey has shown that as well that there is risk with each infection of developing long covid even if so, you um cumulative risk possibly yeah we just simply don't know enough about it but i think everything that we are learning about this virus i mean there is just no good news every single paper i see coming out week after week after week is just about the harms of infection and i just cannot you know consciously i just can't comprehend how we're allowing our children to be infected and infected and infected and not trying to do anything to prevent it my real worry is that in 10 15 20 years time we're going to start seeing the impact of the vascular disease. So we know long COVID is a vascular disease. By and large, it causes inflammation of the blood vessels. And you know, things like diabetes and smoking cause inflammation of the blood vessels. And we know they're associated with heart attacks and strokes and worse outcomes. Um, and we're already seeing on a population level in really big studies that the incidence of blood clots, heart rhythm disturbances, diabetes, you name it. There's a whole list of stuff that if you've had COVID, you're 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 more at risk of. Mm -hmm. And so we've got this entire generation of kids. What and I really worry about what's gonna happen in 15, 20 years' time when they're young, you know, when they're adults in their twenties and thirties. Hey, so okay, I think on that um complicated <laughs> uh so sobering level, we will uh, stop because I think we're gonna run out of time. So I'm gonna stop the recording uh at this point.